folks. Ooh, not too loud? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my husband is in the house. <laughs> and my daughter is here too. Lindsay's sitting right next to him. And so many of our folks are here tonight. We've got folks from a few of our churches. I serve, you know, Coldwater in Bethel and Elberton and Coast Ferry in Harbaugh. And it is a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I'm so honored that I was invited back after the job I did last year. Um, do you still have your rocks? Yes. For those of you who are, are here to, were here last year, we passed out rocks. And I almost didn't want to come back because I was afraid they might throw them at me. Oh, they threw them at you. Okay, well, good. Since you got rid of your rocks, then I'm, I'm okay. Good. Now hold on to those rocks, and that message still stands today. It's not to be That was the message last year. Our scripture tonight comes from Hebrews, and I, actually I have several scriptures. This is just the one that I'll begin with, and this is Hebrews 13, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. But before I do that, allow me to say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable to you. I pray that you would overcome my weakness and that your word might be proclaimed through me. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. So hear now the word of God in Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 5. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the word of God for the people of God. We are sitting in one of the most beautiful churches that I have ever been in, especially since you had your beautiful windows restored. It was about this time last year that y'all were celebrating that. And as I look around, I see so many symbols of our faith, and probably the most important one for us is the cross. Would you agree? That's the most important symbol of our, of our faith. But sometimes I wonder, do we know what that cross means? Do we know? For those of us here tonight, how would you answer the question, what does the cross mean to me? Without thinking, we can answer that it means forgiveness of our sins, right? It means that we've been washed in the blood and we have a new life in Jesus Christ, amen? We know that. In our passage today, we are reminded that the cross means that God will never leave us or forsake us. On a day when a six-year-old boy was buried, we hold on to that promise. God will never leave us or forsake us. At a time when so many of the people we love are getting a diagnosis of cancer or a life-threatening illness, we hold on to that promise. Do you believe in the cross of Christ? Do you really believe the cross is a reminder that God knows our pain. Every time I see that cross, I am reminded of the suffering that Christ went through so that we might have new life. The cross is a reminder to me that God wants so much more for us than this world could ever offer us. I watched a very powerful movie recently. It was titled, Do You Believe? Have you seen that movie by chance? Is there anyone else who has seen that? Good. Isn't it wonderful? A lot of what I am going to talk about tonight, I was inspired by, by that movie. 
And in that movie, and I almost did it tonight, I have this big wooden cross, and I almost made my entrance carrying the cross down the aisle, but I was afraid I might rip your carpet. So I thought, no, I probably shouldn't do that. They might not still love me if I did that. But it was a very powerful movie, and this old street preacher is carrying this large cross down the road over his shoulder. And he stops a pastor, and he asks him simply, do you believe in the cross of Christ? And the man answers him, of course, I'm a pastor, so of course I believe in the cross of Christ. But as the pastor went home, he struggled with that question. Throughout the course of the movie, there are 12 people in a city of 10 million people. Each one of them is searching for meaning. And each of them was forced to answer the question, do you believe in Christ? Now I want to ask you to struggle with that question tonight. The close of the service today, each one of you will get a cross, and I have several different ones. You have a large crowd, so I had to get a menagerie of crosses. But we'll have crosses for you at the close of the service. So I want you to know that that is coming. The cross delivers on God's promises for us. I love it that Lynn chose the hymns that she did, standing on the promises of God. We are standing on the promises of God. God promises to love us, to heal us, to forgive us. And in our passage today, we're reminded that God will never leave us or forsake us. I cling to that promise. I hope you cling to that promise. The cross loves and forgives, but it also demands. It demands a response from us. The writer of Hebrews says, Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing. You ever thought about that person you meet on the street? And you say, I don't have time to help you today. You could have just turned your back on an angel. Have you ever thought about that person in the nursing home? And you thought, I just don't have time this morning. <laughs> have you ever thought about that person who is in the hospital and paying a visit to them? We entertain angels when we entertain those. It goes on to say that we remember those in prison as if we were in prison with them. Now, when was the last time you were in a prison? Don't answer that. <laughs> I know many of you send food into the prison with the Spirit of Christmas dinner, which is a beautiful ministry, and I'm honored to participate in that with all of you. And I asked Ellen to have some of your children color placemats this year that would be used in the prison ministry known as Cairo's Prison Ministry, which means God's time. And I got a stack of placemats this big, so those placemats will be used when we go into the prisons. But you know, when I'm in the prison, meeting with those women, that's someone's daughter. That's someone's sister. That's someone's mother. And we think they're for the grace of God, right? So when was the last time you helped someone in prison? There's going to be a new round of volunteer requests for the Kairos Prison Ministry, and I'm doing a shameless plug right now. But we begin, our first meeting will be January 29th. And it will be a series of weeks that you meet on a Saturday. And it is a great sacrifice to volunteer for this ministry. And you know that we were only able to help 25 women because you have to have one volunteer for every person helped. So we only had 25 people volunteer to help in the prison. We could have done twice that if we had the people willing to give up their time the talent in that ministry. So this time, when you see it in your newsletter, I hope you'll prayerfully consider that ministry. At least come to the first meeting and find out what it's all about. I look around, too, and I see countless people who supported that ministry financially. 
takes two hundred and fifty dollars to sponsor a woman, and I'm proud to say that many of you provided those funds, and I thank you for that support. I hope you will continue to support them. But the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, to honor marriage, to keep our lives free from the love of money, to be content with what we have. Who here is content with what you have? How many of us have a storage building out back filled with stuff we don't need? Amen? We had to rent a storage house, I'm ashamed to say, for some of our stuff. And I need to get rid of it, don't you? I mean, I'm preaching to myself here. They say, here, preach or preach. They are preaching to themselves, and I am preaching to myself right now. We need to let go of some of that stuff. But all of that leads to that incredible promise of God that God will never leave us or forsake us, and I hold on to that promise. Now, if we truly believe that, then our life, our actions, would reflect that belief. Amen? He would. When Jesus began his public ministry, he modeled for us what life as a disciple of Christ would look like. I want to read for you Luke 4, 16 through 19. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year <coughs> of the Lord's favor. Now nowhere in that passage does it say I'm going to sit there and stew on that. Does it? No. It doesn't. Do you hear the action in that passage? To come out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Earlier this year, I had the pleasure of reading and leading Adam Hamilton's Bible study titled Revival. Did you all do that study here too? I thought you did. And of course, as you know, it takes a look at faith as John Wesley lived it. You may know this, but the word revival is taken from the Latin word that means to revitalize. It assumes that life is ebbed away and needs to be revived, Adam writes, to be brought back to life. That's true in every part of our life. How many of us start the year with resolutions to be healthier, to exercise, to eat right, right? How far do you make it with your resolutions? Have you ever gotten past January with those resolutions? Some of you probably have, but I rarely seem to. We have good intentions, don't we? And then something happens. We call it life. Life happens. It gets in the way. We slip up into our old routine of doing what we always done. And we end up not accomplishing anything that we set out to do. I want to suggest that the same thing can happen in our relationship with Christ. We come to faith and we have these peak experiences. Uh, many of us were baptized as infants, and then there's that time in our teenage years when we realize what it is we've committed our life to, and we're so on fire for the Lord, or maybe that happened to you as an adult. And we're there, and we're at a peak experience, but then you keep going and doing and serving, and eventually you burn out and you give up. It's in that moment that we realize we need a revival. We need a revival, and it begins in the hearts of each and every one of us. I want you to hear now Revelation 2, 1a, 2a, 4, 5, and 7. So several verses from Revelation 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you have at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. As you read through Revelation, we read about seven churches, and most of them are people who have fallen away from the love they had at first. They were on fire for the Lord in the beginning, and then something happened. They kind of set back. Or 
Unfortunately, by the end of Revelation, we're very certain that no matter what happens, no matter how faithful we are, we serve a God who is faithful. We know that God is going to make everything new. He promises a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more dying, no more tears, no more crying, no more suffering. And we long for that day. But this first church that is referenced in Revelation is Ephesus. It was a passionate and alive church, much like this church, right? Would you describe yourselves as passionate and alive? But the writer of Revelation begins by saying, I admire what you've done. Then there's that word we hate to hear, but, but, but I have this against you. You've lost your first love. Repent and go back to that first love. What were those first loves? We go back to find our first loves in Acts 2, 42 through 47, because this is the very first revival, that day of Pentecost. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Do you think they needed storage sheds? I don't think so, right? If they had extra, they got rid of it. And then they shared it. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Yes, they ate skins, hot dogs, at church, too. Amen. And they were praising God, and they had the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now that's what the Bible looks like. Amen? We got it all right here, folks. We got it all right there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And I know you know what that's about. For those of you who may not know, your evangelism committee, I imagine, helped very much by Dell, printed these cards and they have my name on them. They're looking forward to having me with them November 3rd. You have been praying for it. And each card is signed by different people. And let me just tell you what that meant to me. It meant the world to me. Last night we heard that everyone needs to be encouraged. This is how you encourage people. Do we do this for our pastor? Are we letting Alan know we pray for him? I hope so. I have a feeling we probably are. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. They shared with each other from their abundance. They spent time with glad and generous hearts. They praised God and had the goodwill of all people in mind. They had such joy in getting together with other Christians. And they were so excited about what was happening that they just had to go and tell folks. Are you excited about what's happening in your church? I am very excited about Star Wars. I want to skip my church service and come to yours. I am very excited about what you're doing in this church. Are you telling folks about that? You're not going to believe what our pastor has up his sleeve. I wouldn't be surprised if he walks out as Darth Vader. Are you going to be Darth Vader one time, please? Tell me yes. Working, Working on it. <laughs> but get excited about what you're doing in this church. What you, we've orchestrated this revival. It's wonderful. But you have something for the children while the adults fellowship with each other. Such a praise. Such a wonderful thing. But then something happened to the church. They became complacent. They were content to live on their past accomplishments. 
They were passionate then, but now they were tired. So they were just going to go into their golden years. And their refrain was, I did that back in the day. And now it's my turn to sit back and relax. Please tell me you've never said that. Let's strike it from our vocabulary. Friends, we are not through until we're dead. All right? We need to witness to the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with every breath we take until we take our last breath. As I read Revelation, I think that the writer might as well be writing to us. Throughout the course of the church, there have been periods of great revival, and there have been periods of great malaise. There was a time in the United Methodist Church when we were starting a new church every day. Could you imagine a time like that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm sorry to say we closed more than we opened that. What's it going to take to turn that around? It is going to take every single one of us. No one person, no one preacher as great as Alan is. He can't do it alone. No preacher can. Not even the best preacher in our world. And that's not me. <laughs> it takes each and every one of us to start a revival. We read throughout the Old and New Testament, and we see it over and over, that God makes a covenant with the people. The people break the covenant. They repent. God renews the covenant. And over and over and over, we see that, and it is still happening today. God sent His Son to show us how to live as the people of God. God sent His Son to die on the cross so that we might know we are forgiven, loved, and free. What an incredible gift that is. Do we live with the joy in our hearts over that gift every single day? We ought to be bouncing out of bed. Who bounces out of bed? Does anybody bounce out of bed? And yeah, we got a bouncer. We got Tigger right here on the front row. Okay, maybe you don't have to bounce out of bed, but you get the point, right? We ought to have a joy in our lives, a spring in our step over this gift that we have been given in Christ Jesus. Our churches, our people, we are in need of a revival. I do believe that we experience revival when we place our hope in Christ alone. And it does begin with prayer. How many of you saw that movie in the war room? Please, more of you saw that, right? Do you believe? I'm encouraged to see that. Was it an awesome movie? I would recommend that for everyone in this church, along with Do You Believe. It was awesome as well. But it's the story of Tony and Elizabeth Jordan. They have great jobs. They have a beautiful daughter, a beautiful home. In fact, I wanted to live in that home. It was a gorgeous house, right? I mean, they had what looked like the ideal life. But then, when you peek inside, it was a different story. What looked like the perfect life on the outside was a disaster on the inside. The marriage was falling apart. The daughter felt unloved and alienated by her own parents. But then their lives take an unexpected turn. And the light came on. <laughs> But thank you, that helps. Um, <laughs> it's like the light of Christ. It helps when you've got that in your life. You know, you can see clearly with the light of Christ. But their lives take an unexpected turn when Elizabeth meets Miss Clara. Now, Miss Clara is a faithful woman of God, and she's turned a closet in her home into a war room. And lined up the walls of that home. Now, first of all, let me just picture that. How many of you have an empty closet in your house? <laughs> we got one empty closet in a room full of I don't know how many, right? And that was a, a work of the Lord to get an empty closet, too. But anyway, they, she took a closet and emptied it of everything. And on the walls of that closet, she had written a strategy of praying. She had things that she prayed for specifically, and she prayed.
prayed daily, morning, noon, and night, whatever she thought of it, she prayed. Now, praying is such an important thing. There's one author that really opened my eyes to prayer. I don't know if you've ever read any of her work. It's Stormia Martian. She has the power of a great parent, the power of a great wife, the power of a, you know, you name it, a church member probably. But she has written several books on the power of prayer. And if you don't have the words for prayer, I recommend Stormy or a Martian to you. She will give you the words to pray. So Miss Clear, she's a faithful woman of God, and she's turned this closet into a place where she prays strategically. Who of us pray strategically? Most of us pray occasionally, right? But she prays strategically, and then she develops a strategy for surrendering every single concern in her life to Christ. She's able to let go of it, trusting that God is in control. Ms. Clara points out that victories don't come by accident. Praying as the people of God is one of the most important reasons we gather in Christian fellowship. I've so enjoyed, as a pastor, being able to sit out here and, and hear the prayers of the people. Praying is such a privilege. Such a privilege to pray for each other. That's one of the reasons why we don't worship as Christians alone. We worship as the people of God to lift each other up, to support each other, to pray for each other. So we come together to lift each other up, to pray for each other, but we also come together as the people of God to challenge each other. That's what I hope to do for you tonight. We challenge each other to let go of whatever distracts us from the cross. What distracts you from living fully into the promises of God? We're challenged to let go of whatever holds us back from complete trust in God. Because when we truly trust God, only then are we remade in the image of Christ. I know from my own spiritual journey over the course of a lifetime, I've seen such a change in, in my own life. And I slip up. You know, I don't claim to be perfect. I want you to hear that. But I can remember when I was in college and I didn't go to church because I was afraid that somebody might tell me what I was doing was wrong. Because I knew what I was doing was wrong. So I didn't go to church. And then eventually I found my way back to the faith that my family had given me as a child. So important to raise our children to know and love Christ. So that they'll return to that if they are astray. And then, of course, when you get married, you think, okay, if I'm going to be married, I really want to have a Christian marriage. I want to raise my children to know and love God. And we got back involved in church. And I was in, but I really think looking back, you know, I, I might have just been a pew sitter. I went to the activities. I was very involved. I did things. But I don't know if it was a heart deep thing. And I say that because now I have a heart deep faith, and I think what I have now is not the same as what I have been. And that's why I wanted to talk about this tonight. How many of us just sit in the pews? We come to church and we think because we're here, we're fine. That's all it is, right? I come to church, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. I want to share something from Revelation that might make you think twice about that idea. It says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm. And neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. This is a vision of the Lord saying this. For you say, I'm rich, I'm prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Are you ready? 
to be hot or cold, or fries, but with them lukewarm. When we're just sitting in the pews, when we're just taking up space, yeah, we like to have good numbers at church, but I'd rather have a church filled with 10 committed Christians than a room full of lukewarm believers. So I ask you, what do you believe about the cross of Christ? When people look at you and see the life you lead, would there be enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? Would they know? By the way you speak to your family members, by the way you treat your family members, by the way you treat your neighbors, by the way you treat your family, your friends, your work associates. Is there enough evidence to convict us? Will they know we are Christians by our love? Will they? God says be either hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. So friends, just sitting in a pew doesn't cut it. It's got to be here. And when God's love takes root in our hearts, it changes us. We have a hunger for God's word. We have a hunger for prayer. We are able to love people we never thought we could love. Not because of our power, but by the power of the one who lives within us. That's what it is to be a Christian. That's what it is to believe in the cross. Do you believe? Does your life reflect that belief? I want each of us to think about our everyday actions. Think about your everyday routine. Is there a time for devotion with God? A time to prepare your heart for the day ahead. At the end of the day, do you thank God? Think about your activities, your priorities. Do they reflect what you believe? I will tell you on days like today, and I have a funeral in one of the churches I serve tomorrow. It will be a difficult funeral. Someone who took their own life.
Let Christ perform your actions. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a great and mighty God. I pray that we will experience a mighty movement of prayer and conviction, repentance, and revival in the hearts of these people. We pray that we would live out the gospel, that others will know we are Christians by our love. I pray that God will raise up those among us who love and seek and trust him and are willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. We live in a hurting and broken world. And not until we proclaim that good news to every single person can we ever have truth. When the world threatens to overwhelm us, let us hold tight to the cross. Rekindle your fire within us so that we might be moved by our love of you to action. Lord, bring a revival. Let it begin in the hearts of each and every one of us tonight. Amen. So what do you think? Do you think...